prairie and its place in God's mission. It's not Prairie College's mission. It is the mission of God. So Prairie College has a rich mission heritage. And as I was given the opportunity to talk about this, perhaps more like forced into it, but no, it was an opportunity. I asked myself the question, how best to pay tribute to that mission heritage and its ongoing claims to the school in our present times? And so, you know, what comes readily to mind are things like, I could reel off a list of accomplishments and achievements of our alumni. I could cite the school's generosity in its financial support of mission agencies. We could list the number of mission agencies either founded or led by Prairie grads. We could list the number of churches that have been pastored or founded by Prairie grads. We could list off the impressive numbers of alumni who have served as full-time missionaries and the wide, over the wide geographical reach of where they served in the world. We could talk about the mission speakers who graced our platform during missionary conferences. It's an impressive array. We could even give an impressive list of faculty who, after serving here, went on to or served simultaneously in some avenue of missionary service, both at home and abroad. But what would this tell us? What would just the numbers tell us? Not much, really other than we can keep count of certain things, okay? It might tell us what things perhaps we might rather not count, or at least not choose to count. For instance, the number of failed missionaries that had to be sent home who were alums. The missionaries who saw family lives perhaps ruined by bad choices. Missionaries who became so jaded once out in the field that not only did they quit the mission, but they left their faith altogether. Missionaries whose secret vices led to the abuse of co-workers, destroyed organizations and churches, and made the name Christian one of ridicule. So these two are numbers. And to tally them side by side with the success stories is simply to reduce Christian mission to some kind of actuarial assessment to see if the risk of missionary enterprise is justifiable. And I think that's wrong-headed. So to frame Prairie's contribution to mission in this context is to ask a wrong set of questions. And it will miss the significance of these numbers. And I am going to come back to some numbers. We are going to get to some statistics. But just to throw them out there is problematic. They need to be put in a broader frame of reference. So I want to take a different approach with you this morning. I want to tell you a story. I am, after all, a historian. And we historians like narrative. We love to tell stories, and some of them are even true. But actually, this is what we are called and committed to. Historians are called to, in their vocation to tell true stories, stories that have meaning and impact. And I can't tell you all the stories of Prairie's contribution to Christian mission. I, I can only really tell you one of them. But having decided to do that, I find that this very quickly becomes a small chapter in a much larger story. And it's a large story, a master narrative that I need to sketch out in order to give Prairie's story a situated and meaningful place in that master narrative. So that's what I'm going to do with you this morning. The mission of God goes as far back as Genesis 12 with God's call to Abraham to leave his home in Ur of the Chaldees and go to a land that God promised him, as well as his descendants. And it was on the other side of the Fertile Crescent. If you can see the map there, you start with Ur of the Chaldees, you have to follow the line, uh, the migratory paths to avoid the desert, and you end up over in Canaan. And however, this land 
in and of itself is only a means to a much bigger goal. You see, God has grand strategy in mind. He says he will not only make Abraham a blessing, but there will be those who bless Abraham who will be the recipients of blessing. Those who respond or recognize him as God's chosen instrument of redemption will in turn be blessed. And then the big kicker at the end of that opening blessing in Genesis 12, all peoples of the earth shall be blessed through you. That's global, okay? So let's keep that in mind. So Abraham goes, and not only is his journey a journey of salvation, or it's not only his journey, it is a journey of salvation for the redemption of the world, the whole of creation, from sin and death and the evil one. And from the outset, God's rescue operation to bring life out of death for all of his creatures, for all of his creations, means some kind of going, some kind of movement, migration, ideally of a voluntary nature, but at times also forced when his people are reluctant to move. So there's this sense that mission has to do with a seeking out, a seeking to go where there are needs. Where, excuse me. <coughs> where his name is not <clears throat> known and proclaimed. So the journey of salvation continues from Abraham's descendants being led, eventually being enslaved in Egypt, <clears throat> and then being led by Moses out of slavery into Canaan via a 40-year pilgrimage in the wilderness. And Israel's entry into an occupation of Canaan finds its earliest success under the leadership of King David. He manages to unite the fractured tribes of Israel under his rule. He invests Israel as his capital city. And he is able to, when he finally figures out how to do things God's way, he is able to move the Ark of the Covenant safely to his new capital, Jerusalem. This is to be <clears throat> his resting place. And it seems that God's mission is on track. David writes a celebratory song for the occasion when the Ark arrives in Jerusalem, and he recalls God's covenant with Abraham, and it's found in 1 Chronicles 16. And I just want to show you a few, or just read a few verses from it. It's recalling Israel's journey to Canaan, God's protective presence over Israel all the while, from Abraham through Moses to their arrival in Canaan. And now he also focuses on a summons to spread the good news. Okay, let's go back here a second. It reads as follows, sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day after day, declare his glory to the nations, his marvelous deeds among the peoples. At the end of the psalm, it concludes with, let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Now, think about this for a minute. These words do not sound like they mean for Israel simply to sit back and carve out a secure national boundary in Canaan. Israel's journey had not come to a stop. Jerusalem and all that it represented as far as the home of God's presence symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant was to be a launch pad for global mission. I mean, the proclamation of God's saving grace among the nations, how are you to do this unless you actually went out to the nations? But we know that Israel didn't do that. They were ideally positioned to do that. Canaan and Jerusalem, as I was telling my Gospels and Acts class yesterday, ideally located along the major trade routes of much of the then known world. It was the best strategic point for going out and doing mission. And yet... When they refused to recognize that, when they began to, in a sense, hoard the covenant promises for themselves or fall away from the covenant promises altogether, they paid the price for their loss of faithfulness. They were conquered. They were deported. A kind of forced migration when a remnant of the diaspora refugees 
actually were able to, after being deported, come back to Palestine 70 years later. They managed to rebuild Jerusalem, they put up a new temple, but not much seems to have changed. Outside of a brief period of self-rule, they were, they were successively dominated and overrun by rival powers who wanted that very same strategic plot of real estate because they recognized its significance. But God seemed to have left the building, or at least abandoned Abraham's descendants. And then, after almost 400 years of despair and perplexity and doubt, the prophetic voice of God among the conquered people of Judea is heard, calling his people to make way for God's promised deliverer. And we know, of course, this is the story of Jesus, the Messiah. Israel needs rescuing. They've been subjugated under the thumb of Rome. They've been exploited by the regime of the Herods and weighed down by the oppression of their own priestly rulers. Israel is given a message of hope and a call to repentance. And God is on the move, but not to satisfy the limited aspirations of Israel's leaders, not just to restore their political integrity, but to reinvigorate his saving mission by sending his own son to bring life, to conquer not the Romans, but to conquer sin, death, and the devil once for all. And it's done by the most unlikely means. And this is what confounds those among whom Jesus walked and ministered, all but a very small few, because the method of doing that was not driving the Romans out of town, but actually being executed by them on a cross. And not them. Nobody escapes complicity in the crucifixion. Not the Jews, not the Gentiles. Everyone's complicit. But death is defeated. Sins are cleansed and forgiven. New life is freed from the chains of sin and death in Jesus' own resurrection. And then he invites his small band of followers to proclaim that message, not just to the Jews, but as David sang way back in 1 Chronicles 16, to proclaim it to the nation, to the nations. But what an unlikely group of followers he commissions for the task. Not that they can do it on their own. They are a motley bunch. But empowered and transformed by God's presence in them, by the power of the Holy Spirit accomplished through the resurrection, they are now going to carry the life of Jesus in them to out beyond, first, of course, Jerusalem, Judea, but to the other uttermost parts of the earth, however reluctant and slow they are to understand that. And so another journey begins. Moving outside Jerusalem to all points of the compass, Jesus' followers begin to proclaim the good news of life in Jesus' name. But just as had been the case for Abraham to Jesus, the journey is fraught with danger and crisis. These are not easy times in which to live. This was no walk in the park. Satan may have lost the war, but he was still capable of practicing a scorched earth policy. If he couldn't be victorious, he was going to drag as many with him down to defeat as he could. And so the first generations of Christians began their, mi <coughs> excuse me, began their migration of taking the good news to the nations. And here I want to introduce you to a couple of historians. One you know quite well, that is the historian St. Luke, whose books, Luke, the Gospels, uh, the Gospel and the Book of Acts, appear in our New Testament. One who is less familiar is the Roman historian Tacitus, and we find them offering two interesting perspectives on the first century when the Gospel was just in its infancy in terms of being proclaimed. The first generation of Christians began their migration in, various, in very troubled times. And let me read you a quotation from Tacitus's histories. He lived, uh, st sort of straddled the first, second century, and he wrote uh, a historical memoir looking back on much of the first century 
of the rule of the Caesars up to about 100 AD. Here's what he says about that time. The history of which I'm entering is that of a period of rich in disasters, terrible with battles, torn by civil struggles, horrible even in peace. Four emperors fell by the sword. There were three civil wars, more foreign wars, often at the same time. There was success in the East, misfortune in the West. Moreover, Italy was distressed by disasters unknown before or returning after the lapse of ages. Cities on the rich, fertile shores of Campania were swallowed up and overwhelmed. Rome was devastated by conflagrations, that means great fires, in which her most ancient shrines were consumed and the very capital fired by citizens' hands. Sacred rites were defiled. There were more adulteries in high places. The sea was filled with exiles, its cliffs made foul by the bodies of the dead. In Rome, there was more awful cruelty. This is the center of the world. This is the source of power. This is the jewel of civilization. He goes on. Besides the manifold misfortunes that befell mankind, there were prodigies in the sky and on the earth, warnings given by thunderbolts and prophecies of the future, both joyful and gloomy, uncertain and clear. For never was it more fully proved by awful disasters of the Roman people or by indubitable signs that the gods care not for our safety, but for our punishment. Not exactly a happy, secure time. And yet this is the world in which Jesus' followers begin to carry out his mission. Now, we turn to Luke. Luke gives us an account of the early mission of the church in the book of Acts. And it seems that any intentional missionary travel is at least through the first part of the book, is the work of individuals such as Philip or Peter encountering people in their own personal wanderings whom they share, with whom they share the good news of Jesus. However, by the end of chapter 11, we see something new taking place. We see a new development. And it begins not in Jerusalem, but in Antioch. And in this city... Paul and Barnabas have been teaching Christians. I just want to read you part of that account. So here we find ourselves near the end of Acts 11. Begin picking it up at verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarshish to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples there were called Christians first in Antioch. Now during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, one of them named Agabus, who stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. So I think around the, uh, between 40 to 50 AD. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for their brothers and sisters living in Judea. They did this, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. This is something, this is a new development. It is a case of one community now acting as a community, not just individuals sort of spreading the seed of the good news of Jesus where they go, but now you have an organized, concerted effort of a worshiping group of believers seeking to undertake a specific mission to another group that is in need. Two things to note here. The church at worship discerns need mobilizes support, and commissions people to serve. The second thing is that God is going to build his kingdom and get his work in the world accomplished through human agents, his image bearers. And so what happens? What does the church do as a church when they hear about something, a place of need 
there are three questions here that they ask. Where is their great need? When they hear about the prophecy and the impending coming, they're willing to listen, they're alert. What resources do we have? And who can we send? That's so obvious, it's not theologically sophisticated. It's so practical, and yet that's where we see the actual heart of a kind of concerted, unified mission beginning to take place. N.T. Wright points out one additional observation which makes this event truly revolutionary. Never in the known history of the world had a multicultural group in one city or region, and that's what the church in Antioch is. It's Jews, it's Gentiles, Greeks, Parthians, whatever. Never had a a multicultural group in one city felt under any fraternal obligation to help a monocultural group in a city hundreds of kilometers away from them. It was obviously well practiced for family to help family, tribe to help tribe, like to help like. Romans and Jews both understood that. But here was something totally different. It broke all the conventions, all the boundaries of loyalties, of how we should think, about giving help. The boundaries of kinship had been reformed around something radically different. Here was a new way of practicing family, brought about by the transforming love of Jesus and the lives of his followers. They had a new way of seeing the world and its inhabitants. And eventually, this vision was going to expand to include all those in any kind of need. It's like the, the sheep, both the found and the lost, going out, being searched by the shepherd and his emissaries and brought back. So over the centuries, the mission of God through his people has simply been variations of this theme, up to and including the founding of Prairie Bible Institute in 1922. When Fergus Kirk and Ellie Maxwell began the school back in 1922, they were, motiva- they were motivated by these same concerns, these same questions. Where is their great need? What resources do we have? Who can we send? And to help focus all this, or to give this focus to all the study and the discipling of students that took place during the school year, Prairie concluded each school year, with a conference dedicated to identifying the great needs of the world and helping those who attended to discern the call of God in their lives. Not just students, but staff as well. What is not so well known is the significant amount of money that Prairie channeled into mission work at the same time. By the beginning of its fifth year of operation, the school had raised $4,000 in a single missionary offering taken at the conclusion of that year. Now, this is the mid-20s. This is when $4,000 actually meant something. Okay, this is a substantial amount of coin. By 1935, Prairie's handbook stated that since its founding, it had raised and dispersed $52,000 to interdenominational missions agencies and sent 10 of its graduates into overseas work. By 1935... Those numbers, or sorry, that was by 1930. By 1935, those numbers were at $89,000 and over 85 graduates in full-time service. And they began publishing a list of alumni in the pages of their handbook, not only when they had graduated, but where they served. And it reads as kind of an alphabet soup of mission organization. CIM, China Inland Mission, SIM, Sudan Interior Mission, UFM, Unevangelized Fields Mission, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. It is impressive, to say the least. By 1955, the school catalog stopped publishing alumni lists because it was taking up too much space, as the total number had grown to over 800. They simply contented themselves with giving a breakdown in terms of the regions of the world where alumni had been or were currently serving and the numbers. 
And so what you end up with is a, uh, some, somewhere in the neighborhood of over eight, 80 countries being served. And this list did not include other graduates who entered pastoral work or marketplace ministries either at home or abroad. If we were to map it out, here's an interesting rendition, and this doesn't even cover China. And so you can see this, you know, from this one school, there is an ongoing missional impact that continued to build and grow and bear fruit. By 1976, that is after roughly 50 years of the school's mission, they could claim that 3,000 of their grads had entered full-time service both at home and abroad and that they had channeled in excess of $4.5 million into mission funds. So that's the numbers. This gives a little bit of a context to Prairie's Prairie's willingness to play a role in God's mission. But there is another dimension to the mission story, also true about Prairie, that's not evident in the numbers. First of all, the location of the school. No one in his right mind thinking strategically about starting a center to equip disciples to be missionaries would have chosen three hills. I mean, come on. (laughs) On the bald prairie, winters are nasty. It's in the middle of nowhere. Well, at least it's close to the middle of nowhere. At least it was at the time. It just makes no sense. Further, very few strategic planners would have seen many of the student body as prime sort of missionary material. Who comes to Prairie Bible College? At least who did come in those early years? Well, there were lots of farm boys and girls. Many of them only had a rudimentary education, say up to grade nine. Many were second generation kids of immigrant families who had newly come to Canada and the U.S. and still found themselves on the margins of mainstream society in North America. And you see, that's, that's where the story of Prairie now becomes or starts to intersect with my story. And those of you who were in the history of Prairie rendition uh, during orientation, you'll be familiar with this already. Prairie had a great ministry of music and outreach and radio, and students and staff served in various capacities. There's the radio choir on the left, and if you look back row, uh, just on the right-hand side of the microphone, There's a young woman there by the name of Kay Rempel, the gospel quartet that joined staff at Prairie, formed by three brothers named Jantz, beginning on the left center and then moving center right. That's Adolf, Hilder, and Leo, and one non-Jantz named Corny Enns, um, found themselves doing kind of gospel ministry, and eventually Corny and Kay met and married, and had four kids, of which I'm the youngest. And that's so cool, okay? They met at Prairie. My dad was a farm boy of Mennonite Brethren background. His parents had come out of the USSR when he was just a few years old, when Stalin was starting his purges in the late 1920s. They settled on a Saskatchewan farm. He only finished grade nine. But Prairie would accept such students in the 1940s. So he went. And let me tell you, there's something about a grade 9 education in the 1940s that's actually pretty respectable. He met a beautiful young woman who sang in the school's radio choir. There, my dad, along with the three Jantz brothers, all from another Mennonite family, formed a gospel quartet, ended up joining the staff at Prairie, and traveling as an evangelistic team on behalf of the school. Now, because they knew rudimentary German, in 1953, Youth for Christ asked them to go to post-war Germany, still rebuilding from the rubble of the Second World War. There was a series of German churches in the northern German city of Zollingen that was looking for some kind of evangelistic help and outreach. And, and Youth for Christ, who they were sort of this ragtag, on-the-go, entrepreneurial mission of the time, 
they had somehow connected with Ellie Maxwell, found out that he had a quartet of boys who had ger- were German backgrounds, spoke some form of rudimentary German, said, let's send them. This is, we, we've got to get going. This is the opportunity. So my dad and the three Jantz brothers went to Zollingen for three months of meetings. And even with their meager, hackneyed German, crowds flocked to their meetings. They were drawn as much by the music as by the preaching. And the warm reception given them during their three-month sojourn there set the stage for their eventual return to Germany by stages. First, uh, Leo and Hilder in 1956 with their pianist Harding Broughton, all graduates of Prairie, and then Adolf and Corny and their families joining them in 1961 to work alongside German churches for the next 25 years. And so we saw an incredible uh, outreach ministry that was warmly received working alongside churches all over German-speaking Europe, whether it was tent uh, evangelism uh, or working some t- and very occasionally with an evangelist the caliber of Billy Graham, uh, building a recording studio for their mu- music ministry, starting a publication. This was all part of a missionary outreach appropriate to the moment that found a warm reception to a needy people. So through these evangelistic rallies, through radio work, camp work, short-term summer Bible school, summer camp retreats, the Jantz Quartet, which is my heritage, I grew up and was able to see God at work in so many of these different venues. But it wasn't all easy. Living as supported missionaries, or rather often under-supported missionaries, God was still clearly at work. And to me, the lives of my parents and others involved in the Jantz team gospel ministry during these years illustrated or served to show Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 in action. See, I think the Sermon on the Mount is not about a new ethical construct by which to live. It's missional. These are the people God delights in sending. These are the people that through whom he will work to bring about blessing. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek, the peacemakers. These are missional people. These are ordinary people, often unsung, on the margins. They're people like you and me. They're people like my mom and dad. They might be people like your folks as well, and you. Well, time and circumstances change. But our world, if we look around at it today, seems very much like the first century. Tacitus could be writing about us. Full of uncertainty, crisis, calamity, upheaval, suffering and need. And amidst the challenges that so easily seem like a giant roadblock of despair and defeat, God's mission will continue to permeate the world with his life-transforming presence through the most unlikely people from the most unlikely places, places like prairie. And so all God asks us to do is to keep doing what the church in Antioch did. We worship, we teach the scriptures, we make disciples, and in the midst of doing that, we ask the three questions. Where is their great need? What resources do we have? Who will we send? Ellie Maxwell perhaps had his own way of phrasing it here. Proclamation by every means available, practice in terms of discipleship in the scriptures, and presence, commitment for the long haul. We're going to send people. And so I, in our day, I wonder if we're getting caught up with distractions. I wonder if we have been once again tempted, perhaps like Israel, to ask the wrong questions about our own territorial integrity, about our own right to control our lives, about our own security and our desire for control, which is at best an illusion. And consequently, we get caught up to listening to the voices that feast on our fears or that reside in the isolated echo chambers of our own making. And so, are we open to seeing what God is calling his people to do these days? Are we open to responding to the needs around us with the opportunities 
that are presented to us? Are we open to seeing opportunity in the midst of crisis? I pray that we will. This is our time. And it's a good time to be a prairie.